Reteach, podcast for teachers seeking fresh viewpoints, deeper subject knowledge, and diverse thinking. Hello, everybody. You're very, very welcome to this Reteach podcast. And in this special edition, I have the delightful pleasure of putting the spotlight on two cutting edge history educators, both currently at the chalk face, teaching history and politics to young people in West Kirby and West London. It's a huge welcome to Katie Amory and Simon Beale. Woo! Welcome, Hello. guys. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Carmel. Hi, Katie. Hi. Hi, Simon. Woo woo, here we go. Now then, um, you guys, whilst you've been teaching at either ends of the country, um, you've been using the reteach materials to help innovate and design and further develop your curriculums. So I'm hoping we can discuss and explain some of the examples and case studies you've used today. That's the plan in any case. So we'll turn to you first, I think, Katie. Now then, Katie. You, it's hard to believe, to be honest, you're so energetic and full of enthusiasm that you've actually been teaching for nearly 20 years. I just, I find that so hard. I think you're, you're like, um, you know, let's say, reteach his answer to Craig Charles this morning, coming live from Northwestern. That's a compliment I've never received before. <laughs> Move on with the Funk and Soul show. We've got Katie Henry. <laughs> there she is, looking like a professional DJ. I wish you guys could see this. I might have to take a photograph, actually. And, talk. <laughs> and she's not only been teaching for nearly 20 years, but head of history at West Kirby Grammar for 14 years. Um, she, mo- you know, characteristically, modestly um, understates her achievements and um, describing herself as an occasional blogger. But she, at the moment, she's the temporary ITT history lead at Liverpool Hope University, which is fabulous. And those trainees are so lucky to have you there. I know, um, mm-hmm. John, that you're kind of covering in for is speaking. Yeah, about yeah, what's yeah. Going on. And uh, you've been writing a textbook at the moment for OUP on African kingdoms due to come out in the summer, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing that with um, Tenny Gogo. Um, some of you might know her from Twitter and we've been working alongside um, Aaron Wilkes and um, Toby Green as well. So that's really quite exciting. That's that's coming. Well, it's available for pre-order on Amazon uh, next week, hopefully. Oh, fantastic. Good timing then. We'll be getting our orders in for that. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And you've got such an interesting curriculum, promoting diverse voices, uncovering fresh perspectives, in familiar history. You've got so much going on. Honestly, it's unreal to think about your day job. West Kirby is a girls' grammar school, I believe, with boys in the sixth form. So you've got 11 to 18-year-old students who are 110 years old and esteemed history. Um, and so going back, there'll be a wonderful, strong tradition of fabulous history teaching at the school. But you've yeah, been using yeah. each to modernise and decolonise. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing at Key Sage 3, maybe with the um, What to Do With Your Loot project? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, So I think like most history teachers um, during lockdown, we were given um, a huge amount of time to immerse ourselves in uh, CPD and really get the cutting edge of historical scholarship. Um, And as a history department, we received... um, a big petition, like lots of teachers, you know, that was signed by huge numbers of uh, present and former students. And it requested that we diversify our curriculum a bit more because they didn't feel that we were given kind of enough representation to, you know, people that had been brushed to the margins of history. Um, So they wanted more black representation. They wanted to see more female representation, disability, LGBTQ plus plus history. Uh, And to be honest, it was quite a difficult pill to swallow, you know, for all of us when we uh, received that petition from our students. But we did have that time to reflect and think about the kind of curricular provision that we offered. Um, And we've worked tirelessly, you know, to promote a wide range of voices. And, you know, Reteach has been really helpful um, in relation to giving us um, kind of a a foundational um, kind of springboard um, to help develop our understanding of topics, to be honest, that we aren't familiar with. You know, a lot of the topics that we're offering at Key Stage 3 at the moment, we didn't study through our degrees. And so I think that Reteach is a great platform for for highlighting uh, some key texts that staff can engage with uh, because as teachers, we're notoriously, you know, time poor. Uh, some great articles and audiovisual clips to really kind of bring the topic alive and give us a door into stuff that we aren't overly familiar with. 
Uh, so one of the first things that, that I did um, was in, in lockdown, I gained a real interest in, in West African history. Um, and I'm a frequent visitor to the World Museum, actually in Liverpool, which is about 10 minutes drive away from my house. I'm on the other side of the Mersey. So some people think I'm a bit of a, a plastic scout. So we've got to go through the tunnel uh, to get over to Liverpool. Uh, but I quite often take my children over there. We go and have a look at the, the dinosaurs on the top floor and then I'll drag them around the uh, kind of global cultures gallery. Uh, and in 2020, in the summer, I noticed the signage had changed there. So um, the, the museum were asking whose history is this because they had a lot of the Benin bronzes and stolen artifacts that had been looted from the Obers Palace in 1897. And really prior to seeing these signs, I'd not really thought about how these objects had been acquired and whether the museum had the right to keep hold of them. Um, but I was fortunate enough to, to get involved in a public consultation uh, with people from the Liverpool 8 community um, of the African diaspora. Um, and they were looking at these objects. We had some really good discussions about repatriation um, and they were working on um, representing them in a way that was more culturally sensitive, you know, to people in that community that reflected Liverpool's links to Benin and Nigeria um, and it told the truth, essentially. You know, I, I, I was rereading actually your, your article in Teaching History uh, last night. You couldn't plan. Uh, in Teaching History 185 and you were looking at building indifference um, and you'd used a quote about, you know, and really lots of teachers are going through this, this process at the moment where they want to be honest and build back in the uncomfortable bits and tell the truth about uh, race and empire and slavery. Um, and this project enabled you know my students and myself to work alongside people from the local community of the Aspirin di African diaspora to hear their voices um, and, and look at how they wanted the object to be redisplayed in a more uh, in a more sensitive fashion, you know, that reflected not only their links to Benin, but really just told the truth about how these objects got there and opened up some really good discussions um, with students and and people in the community. That's incredible that the students said what you know what stemmed as the petition from your students then went on to have such an impact locally and within the city as well. Um, it really. I suppose it could open up career opportunities for students as well there. They can see how with the galleries, the heritage, the museum sector as well, it really, really brings history to life as a dynamic subject, not something that's about, you know, people in the past who are all dead, but actually people who are living at the moment. And didn't you uncover in the stores um, an Afro comb as well? And you had quite an interesting conversation. Yeah, so there was um, th th there's a whole range of objects actually that are, that are still in the stores on the Dock Road in Liverpool that aren't even on display. You know, which I think is a huge travesty. Really, I think that they they should be out or they should be sent back. Uh, in my opinion, um, but a friend of mine from the consultation, um, I call him a friend because we've done quite a lot of work together um, since th this project. Um, Otis Graham, he went down to the stores with his um, auntie, um, and he saw this ivory afro comb that had been looted um, and it was quite triggering for him because it reminded him of being a teenager in Liverpool uh, in the 70s in the early 80s and he remembers having his afro comb uh, confiscated from him by local police and uh, this all kind of links into this idea of the police thinking that this was an offensive weapon and you know he wanted kind of some way in which this object and the significance of it and the resonance of it to him today could be displayed in the new signage and in the new exhibition. Um, and, you know, and, and they've, they've done a really good job of doing that, actually. But, um, you know, it, I, I think it, it, the, the story tells a lot about Liverpool and racism and it's led on. it has led on to other projects. So um, at the moment, I'm working with the, the drama department and um, some people from Toxteth that we met on the project at about 30 year nines and a couple of year 12s. Um, and we're working on an oral history project about the Toxteth uprisings in 1981. So we're interviewing people from the local community. We're gathering uh, oral testimony. We've got some fundage from from um, the National uh, Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, and we're, get, we're hoping to produce a, a piece of verbatim theatre uh, in a year or so's time, you know, with our students and gathering these kind of um, only stories that really, you know, humanise something that we think that we know a lot about and everybody knows about the Toxteth riots, but we're thinking really carefully about the language that we use. I think even the word riots quite triggering, but we're really into to local history. We've been able to pursue that, you know, through our new Key Stage 3 curriculum and it all really stems back to to this petition and um 
uh, you know, a long, hard look at what we offer um, and time to reflect on and, and do justice, you know, to a lot of voices that have been silenced. And that's why I think reteach is so good because it just kind of, you know, identifies straight off and gives you a new perspective and a new point of view on things that you think that you know about that are really familiar. Um, but I think it's really kind of, you know, invigorating to put a new lens on stuff that you feel that you you have a good hold on and it really helps to to make you think differently and challenges a lot of your preconceptions. And also makes it very proximal to the students because it's also local to them. It sounds to me like your Key Stage 3 offering is going to be so bespoke and personalised that the students will really, really buy in and uptake of history will increase and increase in Key Stage 4 and 5 because they'll care about it. The streets that they're walking around, their locale, they'll understand and bring things to life because even though the toxic riots seem like last week in my head, you know, to students today, it's uh, in the dim and distant past, but you're shedding different views upon that, which is fantastic. And following on from that, then you mentioned the use of reteach. Perhaps if we look at key stage four, I mean, going then to the the old stable Nazi Germany, which is, I think I'm right in saying, the most taught topic. Uh, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that you've pointed students in the direction of reteach, not just so much teachers, but students as well. So extra reading or different views of Nazi Germany for them to have a look at. Again, you know, the, the, the a lot of the ideas that we've incorporated um, into our work on the Nazis were sparked off from the grid that you had in your, your teaching history article. Um, so, um, you know, we, we teach the AQA specification and I know that Simon um, also delivers um, the AQA specification for Nazi Germany. Um, but it's useful to, to give students kind of an insight into some different stories. Um, so in particular, you know, there's a real kind of push to promote um, the voices of the LGBT LGBTQ plus community in our school and on the reteach uh, website there are some great materials on homosexuality in Nazi Germany I mean we all tend to focus you know quite rightly so um, on the impact of uh, Nazi policies on the Jewish community um, but I think that the voices of other minority groups have been neglected and I think that reteach points students in the the right direction for for reading and you know pursuing their interests a bit further um, so I know a couple of my students have actually had a read of um, Robert Plant's book, um, Homosexuality, you know, in Nazi Germany, The Pink Triangle. Um, and he kind of drew upon diaries and first-hand accounts from people that were uh, victims of Nazi persecution between 33 and 45. Uh, we've also, in lessons, used some small extracts. Again, this is from the, the Reteach website, um, from Gad Beck's memoirs. Um, about um, you know being a gay Jew uh, in Nazi Germany, and I just think this approach towards you know um, micro history and looking at individual narratives really helps students to open up the the, the the bigger picture and understand what was going on on a far wider scale. Um, there's also a great little clip on there. Um, I think it's from A Warning from History. And what's good about the the reteach resources is that they also, you know, provide staff and students with, you know, short comprehension questions in relation to the clips that are on the website. Um, and there's um, an example of um, a Gestapo prosecution of a woman who a woman who'd been accused of being a lesbian. Um, so I think that. You know, students have really um, enjoyed, you know, just exploring different voices and they've been able to do the same with um, disability. And in relation to um, the Holocaust as well, um, the, the the use of oral testimonies and some of the links on, on Reteach are fantastic. There's one website in particular, um, I think it's called Eyewitness, um, and it's put together by the University of California. Um, and there's over 1,500 short clips from Holocaust survivors and oral testimonies. Um, and these are just fantastic to use in lessons to really help pupils to understand the individual impact of the Holocaust um, and it, it, it just gives them a, a great lens into um, appreciating um, the, the, the kind of the devastation this caused, because I think quite often, you know, they hear the figure six million and they think that that sounds awful. But then they hear one individual story and it gives them a real kind of connection to the past. But I think Reteach has been, you know, integral in developing not only my department's kind of interest in a, in a wide range of histories, but also giving my students a nice kind of segue into kind of the top pieces of scholarship and there's some great articles from from History Extra and the short clips I think are fantastic and, and really accessible. 
I think as well that idea of making it personal. I know you teach Russian history at A level, mm-hmm. and the idea there there's the diaries of Nina Lugovskaya, if I've said that correctly, um, which is kind of like the Russian version of um, Anna. And I, and I, yeah, your some of your students may well look at what being a teenager was like in Stalin's Russia, and again that proximal somebody of the similar age to them, but again a personal individual testimony will help shed a light on something that's maybe big and hard to understand. And, you know, we think about the parallels with Putin's Russia today as mm-hmm. well, the control of information and so on. So there's all sorts of things there that you can take it off up into the sixth form as well, can't you? Yeah, I mean, that that diary is fantastic. And I, I, I honestly wouldn't have known about that um, without reteach. You know, it just kind of drew my attention to this um, really valuable, you know, piece of primary evidence that gives students a great window um, into what Russia was like during the terror. Um, and I think what's um, really important is that students are able to kind of, you know, separate what's going on within the leadership um, and, th- you know, from the ordinary people uh, within Russia, because I think that, you know, it, it's quite difficult to do that now, even, you know, in the current climate, we think about Russia as being the, the enemy and Vladimir uh, Putin, but we don't think about the impact it had on people. Um, but um, Nina's diary, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of working on a, a series of lessons around that at the moment. Um, and it, it was kind of discovered actually quite recently, which she'd written it in 1932 uh, when she was a teenager in Stalinist Russia. Um, her father had been a socialist revolutionary, so he was you know, deemed to be an enemy of the state and uh, he'd also benefited from the new economic policy. So he was really on the hit list you know, for the NKVD. Uh, but in 32, her and her twin sisters and her mother uh, were imprisoned. You know, they were put in a gulag for five years and then they were sent to Siberia after they'd been released for seven years. Um, but her diary, you know, you've compared her to, to Anne Frank. You know, one minute she's kind of talking about whether a boy fancies her or not. And the next minute, you know, she's kind of um, explaining about her hatred towards Joseph Stalin, you know, how she wants somebody to assassinate him, you know, how she hates the, the knocks on the doors that she could hear from neighbours in the middle of the night, uh, you know, during the height of the terror. And I just think that, you know, when I deliver this to students in a couple of weeks time, you know, it, this is going to be invaluable. I mean, we do use um, the whispers, you know, by Orlando Fijas, And I see that that's, you know, also highlighted on the, the Reteach website. Uh, but I think that this first hand account um, is really going to change the way that they think about, you know, childhood um, in Soviet Russia. And I think that, um, you know, it, it's just invaluable. I think it helps make the important distinction between the people and the politicians, doesn't it? Um, really absolutely. Big. Wow, lucky, lucky students, Katie. I wish, I wish I was eleven years old again and back having such a rich offering at West Kirby. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for all of those insights. I'm going to move across to Simon now, or rather, with with Dan Seth to talk to Simon. So Simon is head of history and politics and associate head teacher at Viner's School in West London. He's really passionate about sharing classroom resources online and he's the co-founder of the History Teachers Book Club, which connect, connects colleagues across the country, I would actually say across the world, to be honest, who want to include more historical scholarship in their teaching. Simon also delivers CPD courses and he has written extensively for Hodder Education. So it's very, very uh, warm welcome to you, Simon. Hi, right, thanks, Kamal. Can I first just say, Katie, I've just been making so many notes based on what you said there. Some fantastic stuff. I really want to go to the World Museum. Sounds incredible. You know who can give you a tour, Simon. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll be on Votis. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the thing is, this performance you've got in the, in the work sounds absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I'm so excited about that one. Absolutely. So yeah, I don't know what I can cover here in the, in the, the second half of this session, but we'll try our best. I noticed you had uh, Janina Ramirez at History Teachers Book Club last Sunday talking about Femina, as if you're not surrounded by enough women with your two twin girls there and your wife just having given birth. So congratulations to you. You're surrounded by ladies there down south. Thank you very much. They're so just napping now. Well, hopefully. And uh, yeah, yeah, we're very fortunate. And I mean, as a teacher, you know, it's a, it's a female dominated profession and they are 50% of the population. So they absolutely belong fundamentally in everything that we do. Definitely. Well, we'll, we'll be looking up, we'll be looking up uh, that 
um, recent publication as well. So if we if we take you to your day job in, in amongst all the myriad of other things that you're involved in, um, Viners is a co-educational comprehensive school established in 1960. It's full cap- to capacity. It's expanding. It's outstanding. It sounds like a really, really vibrant place to work with over a thousand students. And you have taken real lengths like Katie to go about creating a departmental vision that is more inclusive of a diverse past. You speak about history being every story. Can you tell us a little bit about how you go about doing this? Yeah, I think one of the advantages of being a well-established school is that you've got a rich legacy of top topics that have been taught, resources, um, and kind of subject specialism that exists in your department. But I think what can happen is also that that can come, become, in many ways, quite stale. And that it doesn't sometimes reflect these growing, changing, diverse communities that, you, that you're teaching. For example, we teach history at A-level, and we've been teaching history at A-level at Biners since the school was founded 60 years ago. There are books in there that are, have been in the, in the department for that time. Now, they are still relevant. You know, A.G.P. Taylor, etc., you know, Elton, there are lots of books we've got in our cupboard that we still use. It's absolutely fantastic. But it does also mean that there is only one kind of viewpoint that's being, being put out there. So, you know, when I became in the department um, about six years ago now, I really wanted to kind of, you know, you get encouraged to as a head of the department. I'm sure Katie will empathize with this, put your stamp on things and, and, and show something. So I, I really wanted to get a general idea. And I've kind of come up with an approach, I think, that seemed to work for us. I think the first thing is, is consulting your department um, to make sure that everyone understands kind of what the lay of the land is like you're currently teaching uh, and, and get people to be able to air their views in a kind of open forum of what they think is working, what they think isn't working as well. Consulting with subject specialisms like the Historical Association, the Schools History Project, summer conferences are great places to go and find out what is actually at the kind of, not just the cutting edge, but there's that term bleeding edge where people are actually doing things at the absolute top of their game. And I think that's a really important part of the process. So that you can build up a kind of criteria of what you've decided and what other people in the profession have decided are the kind of fundamentals of history teaching and, and an environment in the 21st century. Uh, once you've done that, I think it's really important to then actually to, to say about it. Uh, and four points, I think, uh, four fundamental pillars of what you want your history curriculum to do and say and kind of teach students by the time they've left uh, the uh, study. So once, the, once they've done that, then everything becomes a lot more, lot easier. So for example, we said that we want history to be, students to understand that history is d- diverse in terms of people, places, times, and concepts, it, that Britain exists in a global context, that the past helps to explain the present, and we want them to actually understand what historians do, not just thinking them as kind of solid entities, so they understand the process of what historians do. I think it's then really important that once you've done that, you actually think of something that really sells it to, to students. So that's where we came up with the kind of idea and the slogan of history is every story to sell those four key fundamental principles. Then, and this is where reteach comes in, you start auditing what is already there. I do not think that any departments in this country are not doing excellent things, but there's everything, everyone knows that they can tweak something. That there are some, some things that can be tweaked, some things that can be changed, and other things that need to be actually completely either removed or restarted because it's not relevant to your previous context. And this is where, I was saying this to Katie the other day, uh, in a way, um, re-teachers like John Lewis, because it's been specially curated for you. They've, they've found all the really good stuff and put it in one place so that you can go there and then make your life a lot easier, make decision-making a lot easier. Yes, you might find things that you already know and things that Abe actually aren't there because you know you, you still have, might have an individual specialism. But for the broad swathe of history teachers, even the subject specialist is going to find things to plug those gaps that uh, you don't have, like when you're looking for that uh, special present for an aunt that uh, you really want to show off to, that's where you'd go. You'd go to John Lewis. Here, history teachers would go to reteach. So for example, I was tasked with um, restarting our kind of empire scheme of work and splitting it up into three parts that we, that we looked at the kind of foundation of empire, what it was like for indigenous populations, and then the modern day legacy of the British empire. So 
went to reteach, I'd already and it recommended Empire Land. Now I'd already read Empire Land for the for the book club. So I so I had loads of more than that. But actually what it also then started saying was like actually Jeremy Paxman it was recommending Jeremy Paxman to me. Now initially I was thinking, oh this is gonna be like Niall Ferguson. He's gonna sell the whole, you know, empire because there were trains. Actually it's not so bad. But uh, but Jeremy Paxman, and there's a clip on the Reteach website, really is is quite scathing. He, he actually is is much more contemporary in his views than I expected, and and that was actually quite a good way of unpacking the idea of interpretations to, uh, and how those are formed. The Empire Land was a really good format. Then then you got Paxman to to back it up. There's a fantastic Time Watch guide as well, which really condenses the the how documentaries have shown the history of Empire. And another really good way of, of demonstrating interpretation because I've something I'm really trying to do with students is demonstrate that all aspects of history are an interpretation. That just because you're watching a documentary, it doesn't mean there haven't been choices made about what's there. So that when you, so, and then that's where Reach Each comes in. You, you've already did your planning. You're then going on and able to create these much more diverse ne- networks. And I think as a department, without something like Reach we wouldn't have had as easy a time of finding those really diverse stories. And then it sounds like you've made choices in terms of using clips in lessons and things like guided reading as well to make all of that scholarship more and more accessible. And what have been some of your favourite um, new stories that you've uncovered? Yeah, I think just to Jim's first point about making it more accessible, I think when you've got something like Reteach or you have, are faced with the idea of reframing your whole curriculum, it can seem really daunting. Um, I've got kind of like a, a a pyramid, if you will. If you can imagine in your mind's eye pyramid, uh, at the bottom is using new stories to show your enthusiasm for the past. So it's actually to kind of restart or rekindle your own enthusiasm for these topics that you're teaching, which in many cases might be unfamiliar. It then can lead to anecdotes. There are loads of little anecdotes on reteaching. There's little clips and little articles that actually can just enhance the lessons that you've already got by just providing a, a different angle, a different perspective, looking through a different prism. Uh, the old put yourself in different people's shoes. A big thing I, I like doing uh, at the moment is those discussions that we have. That everyone, lots of people have done the kind of opinion line, where you've got put yourselves on that line, and it actually for students it could be quite a barrier because forming opinions is a hard thing to do, and trying to get them to do it in a, in a lesson where you've only introduced the topic for the first time, you can actually just give students that you know, take it from reading, take it from scholarship, give them big opinions, and then get them to place themselves within that continuity. Of opinions and lots of the uh, parts of reteach are really good at, at finding multiple perspectives on things as well. And then obviously, it's there for making resource accessible. Like Katie was saying earlier, there are these clips, there are these diverse stories, there are these sources, as well as actually there are quizzes now. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work done to create these quizzes that mean that actually you can just deploy these things in your lessons um, straight away. Then the harder task of making lessons, schemes of works, and whole curricula based on it are made easier by it. But I think using Reteach in, in any of those ways, all about the pyramid, um, makes it specialised. I've just picked out a couple of examples where I think really speak to this uh, idea of maybe the non-specialist. So um, a bit like, you know, if, if I was looking at Ireland, I'd want to find out what Emmy Quinn's saying about it and what, what she would put together. And if I was looking at LGBTQ plus history in the 20th century, I'd be looking at what Becky Carter's saying. Well, for the Tudors, you've got Estelle Paniquit talking about the Tudors, a very respected Tudor historian that's got intimate knowledge of the whole thing. Looking at um, women in, Tudor, in the Middle Ages, Dr. Anna uh, Woodley. That, so again, that's there with the specialist has curated that list for you. What I've been really impressed with recently is actually how reflective it is and responsive it is to current events. So um, uh, a scientist, Rose Parkin, has done a uh, COVID-19 section which I think is a really interesting thing. The people that do health, for example, medicine in, at GCSE, can really update their lessons through that. The Benin bronzes are, you know, continue to be really, really emotive. And Rebecca Jarvis has done a section on there. Um, really experienced teacher. So that shows that she, you know, she's selected those resources that are really good in lesson. So I think there's loads of things on there. When it comes to new stories, um, you know, there are some on there. And I, I think I'm going to mention some that aren't on there currently, but I imagine will be. Because I think that's how reflective reading is. Obviously, the fives on there. Ali Rubenhold's work there 
is a really good example of someone. If you haven't read that, you haven't revolutionized your mindset in the story of the women in, the, in Whitechapel at that period. Never mind anything else that has got to do with it and people trying to kind of do murder mysteries and crime scene evidence. And I've talked on her podcast about it. Now, I have done those things. But it completely changes your mindset on that. Um, Nicola Tallis is the uncrowned queen about Margaret Beaufort. It's actually a really interesting way of doing the rise of the Tudors about this woman who single-handedly puts her son on the throne by being around during the Wars of the Roses and just not going away and really placing herself in positions, uh, a great risk to herself, but con constantly pushing forward Henry Tudor's story. Like you talked about fem Femina, I mean, every single chapter in that is, is amazing at providing a new perspective. Like, uh, about the uh, Bayo tapestry, the, the Bayo uh, embroidery, as you might now, might now call it, putting the women that created it in, in the story there. There's the Burka woman. But then you've also got, she does this really clever thing of, of putting 20th century stories at the start of each chapter. So for example, uh, Margaret Kuhn and Caroline Walsh smuggling the uh, manuscript for Hildegard of uh, Bingen's uh, story and life story out of Soviet occupied Germany. And that's just like a throwaway introduction, but that would be a fascinating way to link earlier parts of your schemes of work. You know, that there are uh, you know, the last two for me, and I understand I'm pushed for time, that the village in the Third Reich takes a topic that we all think we know and completely puts a microscope on one town of Obertsdorf and then tells you every aspect of of kind of actually post post World War One Germany all the way up to the rise and dictatorship of the Nazis and the fall of the Nazis through the stories of one village. And I think anyone that's interested in local history in their own context, this actually provides a really clever way of saying, actually, well, we can do local history, but it doesn't have to be local to Liverpool, local to West London. We can take a local history and tell stories that way. Because again, it's about friends, lovers, Husbands and wives. It's about all those kinds of intimate relationships that we can know about. It, the book start the midway through the book. There's a tussle for who will become mayor of uh, Oberstdorf, and it's people trying to almost out Nazi each other, which will then come to haunt them later on when uh, the Nazis have fallen, and then recriminations start about who's done what to who within the village. And then the last one. It's a real curveball. I'm reading a book called The Golden Thread by Cassie Sinclair, all about the history of fabric. And, and already as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, it's the thing that's all around us, but we never think about how important it is to what, what we've done. I'm reading a chapter now on the designing of the uh, space suit for the Apollo programs. It's just so incredible about the importance of it. So yeah, I think those are the new stories that are really exciting me at the moment. Well, that's fantastic, and I agree. The the how things resonate in Obenstorf is still the case today. To think of it as a as a beautiful ski resort, you know, it really opened my eyes to what life is like in thinking about the personal, individual stories. And uh, as for golden threads, goodness me, there's so many threads hanging this morning. I could talk to you both all day. You have been utterly magnificent. I cannot thank you enough. You will have inspired teachers, heads of department, and even, you know, textile teachers. Who knows? History is every story, as we've said. We can pick up the, the transferable skills, the cross-curricular opportunities afforded as well by many of these new stories. You have been absolutely fantastic, guys. I can't thank you enough. Katie and Simon, thank you so much for being my special guests on the Reteach podcast this morning. Thank you very much, Carmel. And love to speak to you. Thank you so much for having us. And we're coming to Liverpool, I think, Katie. So look out. Simon and I are on a road. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Bye for now.